your program built the biggest flume I've ever seen. Um, can you describe it for us? Sure. So back in, um, in 1991, we began construction of a facility we call the USGS Debris Flow Flume. And so this big concrete chute is 95 meters long, 2 meters wide, and 1.2 meters or 4 feet deep. And what's most unusual about it is that it's on a steep slope. It's on a 31 degree slope that allowed us to make debris flows up to about 20 cubic meters in maximum size. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is a lot of material. And so my, my understanding from your literature is that the more clay one of these had, the faster it went. And that was, I thought, that well, there's, there's no way is that true because clay's sticky. It'll, like, slow it down. But it's connected to this pore water pressure. Yeah, I mean, the role, the role that the, play, the clay plays, unless you really have a lot of clay, yeah. if the clay gets to be so concentrated that it becomes just a gooey... Gooey mass, right? Yes, that's one thing. But if it has, you know, say maybe up to 20% um, by weight... Dry, that's dry weight, um, that, um, you know, its primary role is basically helping um, the pore pressure to remain elevated by making it more difficult for the pressure to equalize. Mm -hmm. And partly that's just because it increases the fluid viscosity, oh. or at the same time you can think of it as reducing the permeability of the mixture. It kind of does both things together. Right. Um, but it just makes it much easier for the, the high pressures to persist. So if you were thinking about, if you had a soil and you were gonna pump water through it, um, or you had a soil and you were gonna pump like corn syrup through it or something like that, the corn syrup would take longer to pump right. through it and it would maintain a higher pressure if you were to try to compress it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. If you, if you made a debris flow out of corn syrup and rocks, it would have a particularly strong potential to remain liquefied. And so the more, the more clay you add to the liquid phase, the more it behaves like that theoretical corn syrup event. Right. Right. What are some of the other big ideas that emerged from these iconic experiments? I'll talk about just two. One is the difference between a smooth bed and a rough bed. All right. And the other is the difference between a, a rigid bed and an erodible bed. Okay. So uh, for the first, I guess it was the first eight years that we operated the flume, the bed of the flume just had a relatively smooth finished um, concrete surface. It was a broomed, broom finish like they'd put on standard sidewalks. Okay. But we always knew that it wasn't terribly realistic yeah. in terms of most real debris flow. So in the year 2000, we took, took the plunge of, um, of surfacing almost the entire bed of the flume with, with a bumpy bed, with bumpy concrete tiles that we specially fabricated for this purpose. When we switched from the smooth bed to the bumpy bed, certainly the flows became more realistic, and they became both deeper and slower than they had been on the smooth bed. But quite a surprise was that they actually ran out further at the foot of the flume. Even though they were moving more slowly up within the flume, when they reached the relatively horizontal surface at the foot of the flume, which is just a smooth concrete pad, they would actually run out considerably further than they had with the flows running over the smooth bed. And the reason for that all comes back to this uh, importance of grain size segregation again. Because it turned out that by having the bumpy bed, that that increased the amount of agitation in the flow, as you might well imagine. The stuff is just being, you know, rattled, rattled to death as oh, it comes yeah. down across that bumpy bed. And that enhances the grain size segregation process. And when the flows issue from the mouth of the flume, the grain size segregation causes them to form coarse-grained lateral levees that then channelize the ensuing flow um, it doesn't, it doesn't readily escape from over the top of those levees. It just keeps its oh. momentum going straight down. So it's like a rifle. It's just shooting It's like it a farther. rifle shooting the flow out. And so with the smooth bed that we had originally used, what would happen is that we would get levees to some degree, but they were not well developed. And so the, for, the deposits that would form at the foot of the flume would, would spread out quite right. a bit laterally and kind of form a pancake deposit. Um, and then once the bed was roughened, we'd get these long linear deposits. They would mm -hmm. often be twice as long. And it just showed how important um, that, that grain size segregation effect is, not just as a phenomenon of its own um, importance and interest, but the fact that it has feedback effects that, that, that influence the overall dynamics. And so then the other thing regarding basal boundary conditions that, that was um, just as, as important and, and really even more exciting uh, 
had to do with the effect of, of erodible boundaries. And it turned out that by varying the um, water content of that bed sediment through the range of about 10% by weight versus 30% by weight, which is pretty darn wet, not completely saturated, but pretty close to yeah. it, um, got enormously divergent results oh, wow. when we ran debris flows across them. And so, um, again, for the drier sediment, the effect was a, a negative feedback that would just cause the debris flow to sort of bog down and mm -hmm. lose momentum and so forth. But when the bed sediment was sufficiently wet, we'd get this explosive um, positive feedback where what would happen is that as the debris flows ran over the top of this sediment and began to entrain it, they could, they could compress and shear the underlying sediment sufficiently that would actually liquefy the bed sediment. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got a debris flow that it, not only is the flow itself largely liquefied, oh, wow. but it's running on top <clears throat> of a low friction bed. And those things would really move oh, and, wow. and, um, and grow explosively in momentum as well as speed um, because they were picking up mass at the same time they were picking up speed. And those were really exciting. That is an excerpt from my conversation with Dr. Richard Iverson from the U.S. Geological Survey Cascade Volcano Observatory. Richard's team has collected a bunch of these videos as part of a USGS open file report, which is linked in the video description below. For more of this conversation, which I do recommend because we talked about several of these remarkable counterintuitive aspects of high concentration flows, check out episode eight of the RSM River Mechanics podcast in any podcast app or follow the link to the podcast website in the video description below.